The scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, toward the beginning of the Gospel story. It begins in chapter 2, the story of the paralyzed man. Jesus came back to Capernaum after several days, and word spread that he was home. People began to gather in such great numbers that there was no longer any room for them, even around the door. While Jesus was delivering God's word to them, some people arrived bringing a paralyzed person. The four who carried the invalid were unable to reach Jesus because of the crowd, so they began to open up the roof directly above Jesus. When they had made a hole, they lowered the mat on which the paralyzed one was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sufferer, My child, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the religious scholars were sitting there asking themselves, Why does Jesus talk in that way? He commits blasphemy. Who can forgive God? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus immediately perceived in his spirit that they would reason this way among themselves and said to them, Why do you harbor such thoughts? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed person, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. But so you all may know that the promised one has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus then turned to the paralyzed person. I tell you, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. The paralyzed person stood up, picked up the mat, walked outside in the sight of everyone. And they were awestruck. And they all gave praise to God and said, We have never seen anything like this. Well, friends, in a time when human kindness seems to be in short supply, It's rather heartening to listen to the accounts of those who are. Steve Hartman, the CBS Evening News correspondent, provides a glimpse of this in his weekly segment, On the Road, which you may be familiar with, where he shares human interest stories that reflect our better angels. Nearly a year ago, in the initial days of the pandemic shutdown, he started a series called Kindness 101, that portrayed a range of stories of both courage and compassion. It was a way to remind people to uh, be kind to one another, to be kind to one another. But a good example of this was actually shared by him a few years earlier when he charted the life of Chris Rosati, a Durham, North Carolina man in his early 40s who was diagnosed with ALS in 2012 a terminal condition better known as Lou Gehrig's disease. And before this time, Chris had lived an appreciably charmed life with a successful career in technology, beautiful family with wife Anna and daughter Logan and another child soon on the way. And he was also in superb physical condition, as Anna remarked. She said, Chris was in the best shape of his life, doing a second or third triathlon. Needless to say, His alarming diagnosis and life-ending condition was the furthest thing from their minds. Still, Chris took on the challenge, accepting the limitations on his life. And how he did it was what caught the attention of on-the-road viewers. Hartman writes, I first met Chris Rosati in the winter of 2013. I heard he wanted to steal a Krispy Kreme donut truck, drive it around his hometown of Durham, North Carolina, and give away its contents. He wanted to be a thief like Robin Hood, only with stickier fingers. And he assumed Krispy Kreme wouldn't prosecute him. Why would they lock up a dying man who just wanted to make people smile? Well, eventually, the Krispy Kreme company caught wind of the plot, gave him a truck 
and a thousand donuts to give away. And I rode with him as he spread the sugar high. It was the first of his many adventures promoting kindness. Well, when disease progression limited his activity, Rosati then began to expand his life-changing vision by offering grants of $50 each to children who would do something to change their world with kindness. And this campaign caught on like fire and soon spread around the country, including here in Connecticut. And Chris named his inspiration Butterfly Grants, prompting small acts of kindness that morph into something more beautiful for the world to see. And eventually, this campaign evolved into a permanent nonprofit called Inspire Media, Inspire Media Network, which became Chris's focus to the end of his life. And from what I understand, this inspirational legacy continues to this day, long after Chris's passing in the fall of 2017. Now, why does a story like this resonate with so many? Man, so many who are inspired to make a similar impact on the world. Is it because it's intrinsic to our sense of well-being, where everyone yearns to receive and to pass on kindness and goodwill? Perhaps. Perhaps. I mean, can we even live without kindness? Or is it due to the, the obvious irony in this story? Namely, a paralyzed man with a limited amount of time, devoted not to his own increasing level of care, but instead in trying to express and to inspire care for others. I mean, he who should receive help was helping others to brighten their lives. Hmm. Now, to be fair, Chris wasn't unique. He wasn't all that special, nor was he even predisposed to be this way. I sense that had he remained in good health, there's little to suggest that he would have been committed to this endeavor even. He probably would have remained focused on his career and family like most people. It was the ALS that prompted the metanoia moment in him that reoriented him to what was important in life and brought about a sense of urgency and purpose he otherwise might have lacked. In fact, I think, in many ways, Chris provided the perfect example of how spiritual change often comes about. Kindness isn't merely an attitude that comes with being a nice person. It is in evidence through concrete deeds and actions, tangible expressions of mercy. That's what makes someone kind. Nice people might not do kind things when you think about it. And those who are not nice, well, you know, they very well may. Kindness frequently begins with intentional and, and, and dedicated actions that then reshape the attitude and the person's personality. In other words, it doesn't require a kind person to do kind things, but kind actions, if it's done repeatedly, that will conform a person's character, conform a person's character in, in, in their attitude, in the intent behind the deeds, and turn them into a kind person. Doing kind things creates its own corresponding spiritual ecology, as it were, within and around us. Now, biblically, Kindness is considered a fruit of the Spirit, which is the emphasis we have during this season of Lent, fruit of the Spirit. And we're to understand this as, a, as an expression of the Spirit's presence within us, and I think as well a person's desire for an expression of this Spirit within them. And theologically, this makes perfect sense. However, kindness I think, is not just a religious inspiration. As if to say God's spirit of goodness and grace can, can, can only be evoked, invoked by pious and devout people. If that were true, there might never be enough kindness in this world to sustain us, to redeem us. 
doesn't say much about religious people, but it's true. And the reason I say this is kindness is an essential quality to the human spirit, regardless of the person or place. Life occurs because love and kindness come together, it surrounds it, it envelops it. And our faith and our moral sensibilities, that, that should help us to capably develop its radiant and its, its regular expression, much like a domesticated, cultivated fruit tree will produce better results than a wild one. But the divine spirit of kindness is not limited to those who can easily name the source of inspiration. Hence, though it's intrinsic to God's spirit, kindness is evident in many places that are far removed from settings normally viewed as sacred. Now, the story that I read earlier for Mark's gospel reflects exactly what I mean. It's a story about a paralyzed man whose friends sought healing for him from Jesus. It didn't, however, take place in a synagogue or at the temple. Instead, they found Jesus and the spirit of kindness displayed in an ordinary house, the universal place where much of life's pain is experienced and born. And like Chris Rosati, the poor man was paralyzed. He was disabled. He was unable to use his body in a normal fashion. His limbs withered away due to some underlying and overwhelming condition. And yet the cause wasn't deemed medical, but moral. In the common cause and effect logic of the ancient world, people lost the use of their limbs because of something they did. Something went wrong spiritually or morally to bring about this condition. And the resulting consequence was interpreted then as a divine judgment, as a punishment upon this precipitating sin. Nothing happened by accident, you see. In the justice of life, people received what they deserved. And as ancient a notion as that might be, I do think we still use this sort of punitive and primitive logic from time to time. It does make me wonder, though, how many people mirror this predicament, namely that they're paralyzed by something, be it situations they're in, conditioned of their lives, whatever. I mean, maybe you've been there yourself. I mean, think of times when you've been You've been so overwhelmed that you felt absolutely disabled. You were unable to move. You were incapable of functioning properly, completely frozen in the moment. You didn't know what to do. You didn't know how to go forward. And certainly all sorts of things will paralyze people. I mean, fear of a contagious virus. Has that not paralyzed many of us over this past year? Could be physical illness, might be mental illness, certainly, depression, anxiety, financial setbacks. They paralyze us. Stresses of all types, chronic economic hardship, that can disable people. Broken and estranged in estranged relationships, that'll do it. Virulent racism, sexual violence, political oppression, all of these things paralyze people, addictions, of course, one type or another, a criminal record, that'll do it. Not to overlook, of course, the impact of social isolation, bitter disappointment, angry resentment, the gloom of failure, nagging grief. You know, the list is really quite long. It's quite long. People get paralyzed by traumas that prevent them from being well and at being their best. Meanwhile, the rest of the world goes on around them, seemingly oblivious to their condition. They feel more and more disconnected from meaningful support and from a sense of well-being and peace. They are in the world, for sure, 
But for all intents and purposes, they are just not a part of the world. Not a part of the world. Now this likely would have been the life sentence of this paralyzed man in this text. You see, paralysis in the ancient world really had no restorative prospect. As the story is told, four friends, could have been family members, but they had mercy on this poor man. They insisted that Jesus see him. They were desperate. And one could say they weren't very nice about it. But their efforts were essentially kind. They not only carried him to Jesus' house in Capernaum, they were demanding enough to literally break through the roof to get their friend to him. Now, as I try to imagine this scene, it expresses kindness, I think, in two ways. Obviously, in the actions by the friends who went to extreme measures, obviously, to make sure the man was seen, but also in the way that Jesus responded to this rather rude disruption and violation. I mean, he could have gotten angry. He could have dismissed them altogether. It wasn't like he never did get angry. But as we see, Jesus chose the path of kindness as he considered this man's desperate plight and not the assault upon his property. Reading from the text, it says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sufferer, My child, your sins are forgiven. Now, we might easily assume that that was in reference to the damage that had just been done. Oh, don't worry about the damage. Whatever you did to my house can be repaired. That was... That's not what he was forgiving. What Jesus was forgiving were the original sins perceived to have caused this man's paralysis. Nothing was named. No one was publicly shamed. But Jesus knew that everyone believed this man's paralysis was due to his sordid past and broken spirit. I mean, given his state... He was already declared a dead man in the eyes of God. Except, Jesus awakened everyone to the power of mercy and forgiveness, of compassion, of grace. This man's unnamed sins were erased. His eternal standing was restored. And for a paralyzed man with a short life expectancy, you know, maybe that would be enough. He could live. He would die. Knowing his past, at least, was forgiven. The story, though, doesn't end there. Mark goes on to note that Jesus apparently sensed that some of the religious leaders who were witnessing this moment we're not all that comfortable with his absolution of sin. Now, from our perspective, we're just, that's Jesus being Jesus, right? I mean, that's what he does. But at the time, this would have been viewed not as kind, not as merciful, but rather as an audacious act of hubris. Jesus was playing God. I mean, God had clearly judged this man by virtue of his pathetic state. How could this man from Nazareth reverse the course of the clearly expressed divine will? I mean, the man was paralyzed. How could Jesus claim the authority to override God's will and forgive past sins, for even the temple priests would not presume to do that on an individual basis? Only God could do that at the final judgment. And what must have really stuck in their craw was this. How could Jesus dare to exonerate someone clearly meant to be a moral example, a fair warning to the rest of the population of the consequences of sin, and especially to do this without even consulting the religious leaders, the authorities, who may not be so forgiving or forgetful? Who was he to decide who gets off the hook? 
And that would be a very good question. Not easily answered early in Jesus' ministry as this took place. But one thing we do know, this is what extravagant kindness will do. It will overlook the evil in evildoers to redeem them. People don't have to permanently pay for their sins. Acts of mercy, in fact, are some of the the best illustrations of what kindness truly is. Intervening with mercy, I think, is the truest expression of kindness. Also explains, I think, why nice people are not always so kind. And what I mean, what I mean is many nice people will resent acts of kindness being offered to those who are viewed as undeserving. For them, mercy is to be doled out as favors to those who have earned it. Or they may think kindness is just too easy on unworthy people. They would prefer tough love. There are those today who are very, very nice people. But they would rather be harsh than kind to those who are troubled, those who are paralyzed. They are convinced kindness displays weakness. Troubled people will just take advantage of it. Being compassionate and empathetic makes one vulnerable to harm. Showing mercy defies human justice and appropriate consequence. They aren't even kind to those who have served sentences and have been paroled. They intentionally put barriers in the way of recovery. They keep problem people paralyzed, unable to move forward, but then they are still considered nice. They view mercy, much like those who judge Jesus to be blasphemous. I mean, didn't Jesus understand God's law? Didn't he realize that this man's paralysis was exactly what protected the community from an evildoer? Allowing him to walk, you put everyone at risk. You don't mess with evil by letting him off the hook. However, kindness. Kindness is what begins the process of redemption for any human being. And it took four kind people with a lot of nerve to get through to Jesus that this man needed help. And it takes a church full of people at times to stand up with those who cannot stand up for themselves. True kindness isn't about being nice and saying the right things, safe and limited to people who already enjoy a Hallmark card reality. No, kindness is about doing the right things. The redemptive things. Kindness is a powerful gift of mercy because it expresses an awareness, it expresses an acceptance that the recipient is a person of great worth and value regardless of how paralyzed they are by life. And again, it doesn't require a kind person to do kind things, but kind actions, if they're done repeatedly, will conform a person's character and attitude to the intent behind the deeds and turn them into kind people. Doing kind things creates its own corresponding spiritual ecology within and around us. Another story Steve Hartman told is likewise about a paralyzed man, much like the one in our text. This one is about Jamil McGee. Jamil McGee from Benton Harbor, Michigan, who was minding his own business one day when he was accused and arrested for dealing drugs. He was processed into the criminal justice system, offered a no-choice plea deal, sent off to prison for a crime he claimed claimed he'd never committed. 
He didn't commit. And the truth is, he didn't commit the crime, or any crime, for that matter. But that didn't come to light until years later, when the arresting officer, Andrew Collins, admitted that he falsified the report. As Collins confessed, basically at the start of that day, I was going to make sure I had another drug arrest. And by the day's end, he successfully put away into the system an innocent man. That's power. That's privilege at work. It was four years before McGee would be released from prison. Whereas Collins, convicted on several counts of planting drugs, stealing, and falsifying police reports, served merely 18 months in jail. That was his sentence. And though he was innocent and exonerated, McGee came out traumatized by his unjust sentence, paralyzed by few prospects for getting his life back in order. And as Hartman tells the story, he says, by sheer coincidence, they both ended up at a faith-based employment agency, Mosaic, where they now work side by side in the same cafe. And as it was in those cramped quarters that the bad cop and the wrongfully accused had no choice but to have it out. However, it didn't go as it might seem. McGee, inspired by his Christian faith, offered to Collins a kinder resolution. As he told Hartman, he said he wanted to be an example of kindness, not bitterness. And it eventually led to a process of truth and reconciliation. And according to Hartman, now he and Collins give speeches together about the importance of forgiveness and redemption. A remarkable example of the fruit of the Spirit with unparalyzing kindness, unparalyzing kindness. Chris Rizzotti was a paralyzed man. So too was Jameel McGee, but in a different way. And yet both condemned men provided evidence of the effect of kindness in this world Maybe because of their respective weakness, they both discovered great strength and a source of ultimate healing. As immobilized by life's cruelty as they both were, they made a choice for unparalyzing kindness, a revelation and a relief to so many, including Hartman, who has continually found that Kindness is essential to everyone's well-being in life. And this is why he shares his stories. For when you're out on the road as he is, you're fortunate enough to find the very people and the ways that show it. Join me, if you will, in prayer. Kind and merciful, compassionate, gracious God. Yes, once again, we need to learn from you. From your spirit, but also in the people where you are embodied. Who are unparalyzed by kindness and offer the same to others. We so often misconstrue what kindness is. That's why we don't do it very well. We often think that attitude is enough. Intentions are good. But it's deeds, it's actions, it's acts of mercy 
often intervening in very difficult situations. That's where kindness is expressed. Perhaps we've been the recipient of such kindness. Perhaps we have been the one who expresses it. But help us as individuals and as a congregation to take the spirit of kindness very seriously. Not as a religious duty, but as a human a human obligation one to another so that we may live our lives well and we may help others do the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.